Good day, everyone. So our today's topic is on amino acids and peptides. And this topic is a foundational topic in your understanding of proteins. So you really, you really need to have a good grasp of amino acids and the bond between amino acids that form proteins. Okay, so let us start. The references that I got from this lecture are from Biochemistry by Mary Campbell and Leninger's Principles of Biochemistry by Nelson and Cox. But the main reference is from Campbell. So please read the chapter on amino acids and peptides in Campbell's chapter. So the following is the outline of our lecture. So the first is to discuss the structural chemistry of amino acids. So let us first define what is or what are amino acids. So amino acids are alpha amino substituted carboxylic acids, which are considered to be the building blocks of protein. So let us dissect the, the definition. So uh, it is called an amino acid because this is an alpha amino substituted carboxylic acid. So one carbon that is attached to the carboxylic acid is actually not a carbon, but it is an alpha, uh, it is an alpha, it is an amino group, okay? So it is a carboxylic acid because the definition of a carboxylic acid is a carbon that is double bonded to an oxygen with a hydroxyl group, okay? So later on, we'll, you'll have a better picture of what that means if you have an illustration of the basic structure of amino acids. And when you hear amino acids, you always think of that they are the building blocks of proteins. So proteins are macromolecules that is very abundant in living systems, not just humans, but all living systems. Okay, but before uh, divulging into the specifics of amino acids, let us first have a brief introduction of proteins. So proteins mediate nearly every process that takes place inside the cell. So almost all biologic process will always involve proteins, okay? So glycolysis, okay? Metabolism, okay, when you see your mirror, you have a long nose. The reason why you have long nose is due to differences in proteins, okay? The reason why you have different colors of hair is due to variety or the variations of proteins. So proteins, they are the most abundant biologic macro, biological macromolecules. So we have different types of macromolecules. We have lipids, we have carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, and last but not least is the pro are the proteins. Now, these proteins are the most abundant biological molecule. And all proteins, regardless of an organism, whether it's a plant, an algae, a bacteria, they are composed of the same set of 20 amino acids that are incorporated into them during the process of translation. Now, this translation, this is a component or a part of the central dogma of molecular biology. So the central dogma of molecular biology, this is the main reason why we have life. So the central dogma of molecular biology includes the replication, transcription, and translation. Now in the process of translation, it is the process by which mRNA is read by a ribosome. And this ribosome creates a protein to the process of translation or protein synthesis. So translation, the other name for translation is protein synthesis or the creation of proteins. And due to the nearly limitless variety in the sequences of amino acids and proteins, nearly all imaginable functions can be encoded in proteins. So you have different combinations of sequences of amino acid to form a protein. And because of this, you have a lot of function that can be carried out. That's why we have a list of uh, a, a long list of biologic process that are mediated by proteins. This is what a proteins 
um, are very why this is why proteins are very important in living systems, not just humans. Okay, so let us discuss the structure or let us describe the structure of amino acids. So the general structure of amino acids include a uh, an amino group, a carboxyl group, an alpha carbon, and a side chain group. Again, the general structure of amino acids include the amino group, the carboxyl group, alpha carbon, and side chain group. Please remember this one. So this is the structure of a basic, the basic structure of amino acids. So again, we have four general structure of amino acid that you should know by heart. Okay, you should remember, you should have a picture of this in your, in your mind. So the general structure of an amino acid is we have an amino group which is um, exemplified, which is illustrated in this one. We have an, a nitrogen that is bounded into two hydrogen and a carbon. So that is the amino group. We have, this, we have the carboxyl group. This is the carboxyl group. Again, the definition of a carboxyl functional group is that it contains a carbon that is double bonded to an oxygen and the carbon is also bound to a hydroxyl group. So this is the carboxylic acid group. So you have a carbon that is double bonded to an oxygen, and that carbon is also bound to a hydroxyl group. So this is a carboxylic acid. So it, it is called um, a carboxylic acid. We have an alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is the one that is next to the carbon of the carboxylic group. So this is the alpha carbon. And the alpha carbon is the one that is bound to the amino group and the carboxyl carbon. So this C here, this is the carboxyl carbon. This C right here, the carbon here is the alpha carbon. So when you hear alpha carbon, it is not the carboxyl carbon. It is the carbon right next to the carboxyl carbon. When we say carboxyl carbon, again, this is the carbon of the carboxylic acid group. So the alpha carbon is the carbon right next to the carboxyl carbon or right next to the carboxylic acid, not the carbon of the carboxylic acid, okay? And we have the side chain, which is represented by R. So side chain, this determines the identity of a particular amino acid. So what are the similarities of all amino acids? Okay, so we have a carboxyl group, we have the amino group, alpha carbon, and hydrogen bound to it. So this is the alpha carbon. So basically the alpha carbon makes the center of the amino acid. And the only difference why we have different amino acids is because of the side chains. We have different side chains. Okay, so before further discussing about the amino acids, let us discuss or let us describe on the different conventions on how we name uh, or how we describe the, the atoms in and the amino acids. So we have two methods. This is this this comes this came from the Leningers. So we have two methods. The first method is to assign additional carbons in an R group designated as um, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. So we utilize the Greek uh, alphabet. For the second method is the carbon atoms are simply numbered from one end, giving the highest priority to the carbon with a substituent containing the atom of the highest atomic number. So uh, the, uh, we delegate the, the carbon number one with the carbon containing or a carbon that is bound to an atom with the highest atomic number. So for, for method one, okay? So as what I've mentioned, an alpha carbon, so this is the carboxyl group, okay? So this is the carboxyl group. This is the amino group, okay? This is the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is the one next right to the carboxyl carbon. So this is the carboxyl group. This is the carboxyl carbon. 
the carbon beside that, that is the alpha carbon. And the carbon beside the alpha carbon is beta, gamma, delta, and so on and so forth. So carbon lang yan. Now, in this other method, yung 1, 2, 3, 4, they assign carbon 1 to the carbon containing the atom of the highest atomic number. So oxygen has the highest atomic number compared to nitrogen. That is why it is delegated as carbon number 1. Okay? So wag malito sa C1 or alpha carbon. So C1 refers to the carboxyl carbon and alpha carbon, that is the carbon that is right next to the carboxyl carbon. Okay, so the, I hope this is very clear because this will, um, in our discussion further in proteins, they will just tell you carbon 1, C1, C2, C3, or alpha carbon, beta carbon, gamma carbon, delta carbon. So you need to know what that means. What does what carbon 1 means or C1 means? What does an alpha carbon mean or beta carbon? Okay, so... Please remember this convention. So next is we'll be discussing about the stereochemistry. So what is stereochemistry? So stereochemistry is the branch of chemistry that deals with the three-dimensional shape of molecules. So the one that you see in this image, this is a structure of amino acid. So this is a two-dimensional picture only. But in reality, Amino acids are in three-dimensional structures. They are 3D, okay? It's not just a flat molecule. It's actually a three-dimensional molecule. And we have the term called chiral. So this is a very important term. So chiral, this refers to an object that is not superimposable on its mirror images. So when we say superimposable, Hindi siya ma, uh, hindi siya ma, uh, hindi siya ma, uh, masapaw, or hindi siya ma, um, masapaw is like, hindi mo siya ma, what's the other term for that? Eh, hindi siya ma, ma put on top, okay, to cover it. So you cannot put, put on top to cover it. Okay, so that is Indonesia super, superimposable. We say chiral. And a lot of biomolecules, especially proteins, as well as carbohydrates. So later on, we'll discuss about carbohydrates. A lot of them are chiral. So I think you have already covered this one also in your organic chemistry. I hope it was covered in organic, in organic chemistry. Okay? Or chem. So we have also the terms stereoisomers. When you say stereoisomers, these are molecules that differ from each other only in their three-dimensional configuration. They are also called optical isomers. And when you say enantiomers, these are stereoisomers that are non-superimposable images of each other. Okay, so for example, your left hand and right hand, they are not superimposable. Hindi mo masapaw. Okay. okay, for example, this one, flask, an Erlenmeyer flask, if you bring them together, they can be superimposed. So that is what we mean by uh, they, can be in super, they can be superimposed, they cannot be superimposable. So we, when we have chiral molecules, they are like this. They are not superimposable. So our amino acids, most... Uh, almost all of our amino acids are chiral, except glycine, okay? Except glycine. So they are enantiomers. They are stereoisomers that are not superimposable. They are non-superimposable. So for all common amino acids except glycine, the alpha carbon... This is the chiral center. So the alpha carbon, this is the one that is the chiral center because it is the one that when you say chiral center, okay, I think it was discussed here. 
So when you say chiral center, that atom is bound to different groups of molecules. So all common amino acids except glycine, the alpha carbon is a chiral center. So, so sa lahat ng amino acids, so for example, this one, alanine, where is the alpha carbon? So again, to orient you, when you see a carbon that is double bonded to an oxygen, automatically, this is the carboxyl group. Okay? But remember, later on, they, they, there is a, there's an amino acid that contains a carboxyl group. So what is your clue? Your clue is the alpha carbon. So the alpha carbon, make you have to make sure that the alpha carbon is bound to an amino group. Okay? So this is the carboxyl group. This is the alpha carbon because that is the one that is bound to the amino group and that is right next to the carboxyl carbon. So this is the carboxyl carbon because this is a carboxyl group. So this is the alpha uh, this is the alpha carbon and as you can see the alpha carbon it is bound to four different groups. So first is hydrogen. Next is the amino group. Next is the carboxyl group. And lastly, this one. This is the methyl group. Now for glycine, so again, to reorient you, this is the carboxyl group because you have the double bond oxygen. So right next to that is the alpha carbon. And why this is this the alpha carbon? Because um, aside from it is right next to the carboxyl carbon, it is also bound to the amino group. Okay, so in glycine, the alpha carbon is bound to only three different types of groups. So you have two similar um, atoms that are bound to, to the alpha carbon, which is the hydrogen which makes this a chiral. Because when you say chiral center, the alpha carbon should be bound into four different groups. So in glycine, since dalawang hydrogen ang nakabind sa kanya, that makes it a chiral. A chiral. So A-C-H-I-R-A-L. So this one, glycine is a chiral. So alanine and the rest of the amino acids are chiral. So... So the position of the amino group on the left or right side of the alpha carbon decides, uh, determines whether you have an L or D designation. And most of our proteins, now all of our proteins are in the L form. Well, we have also D forms of amino acid, but they are usually found in bacterial cell wall and, and some antibiotics, but they are not usually found in proteins. So what does that mean? Okay. So yeah. <clears throat> so we have an L and D configuration of amino acids. So when you say L, L means levo or left. D means dextro or right. Okay. So how do we determine if it's an L or D amino acid? It is, um, we, re, we, we, our basis for this is the position of the amino group. So this is what. So as you can see in the Fisher projection, the position of the amino group is on the left side. It is written on the left side. So therefore, this is an L amino acid or L amino uh, uh, levo form levo form of the amino acid so because the amino group is located at the left side if the amino group is located at the right side then that is dextroalanine or d alanine but again most of the proteins in the body i mean all proteins of living systems not just of, of the human all living systems they are in the l form only a few, very few um, in nature where you can find D form. Okay? So L and D is also applicable for 
other molecules such as glyceraldehyde and also in carbohydrates. So later on, we'll discuss about the, the topic on, on the, the, the monosaccharides. They also have the L and D form. Okay, so in carbohydrates, the most common form is the D form, while in proteins, it's the um, L form. Okay, so again, so this is an L amino acid. So the L amino acid, L alpha amino acid, meaning the, the amino group is located at the left side, and D amino acid the amino group is located at the right side. And again, in living system, it is the L form that is prevalent. Okay, so let's move on to the classifications of amino acids. So amino acids can be classified by the R group. Okay, so again, we have four, um, we have four groups for the amino, for the structure of amino acids. Again, we have the carboxyl group, you have the amino group, you have the alpha carbon, and the R group or the side chain. The R group or the side chain is our basis for the different types of amino acids. So we can classify proteins, uh, we can classify amino acids into hydrophilic or polar amino acid or hydrophobic or non-polar amino acids. Okay, so again, hydrophilic, when you say hydrophilic, they love water. They are water soluble, meaning they are polar or they are polar substances or they are polar molecules. When you say hydrophobic, they are not water soluble. They are usually soluble with lipids. Okay, so they are hydrophobic, therefore they are non-polar. Okay. For under hydrophilic or polar amino acids, we have Negatively charged polar amino acids, we have positively charged amino acids and uncharged um, polar or hydrophilic amino acids. So these amino acids, they if they are dissolved in water, they, they, easily, they easily dissolve in water because they are hydrophilic. When we have hydrophobic amino acids, we have two. We have an aliphatic side chain and an aromatic side chain. Now, I want you to define what is that aliphatic, I mean, ibig sabihin ng aliphatic, okay, and aromatic. Okay, so this is just a review in your organic chemistry. So, okay, so when we have aliphatic side chain, our amino acids are alanine, phalanine, leucine, isoleucine, proline, and methionine. For aromatic hydrophobic amino acids, we have tyrosine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. For negatively charged hydrophobic amino acids, we have aspartic acid and glutamic acid. For positively charged hydrophilic amino acids, we have lysine, arginine, and histidine. For uncharged hydropho hydrophilic amino acids, we have serine, threonine, asparagine, glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. Unfortunately, you need to remember this one. You need to memorize all amino acids, okay, for you to have a good understanding of the proteins. So now let's have the individual amino acids. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will be able to know the structure. You need to be familiarized. You need to familiarize yourself with the structure of the amino acids, okay? Because that is very basic. If you're planning to take up the NMAT or if you are planning to take the MCAT, so the MCAT is the, 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 the US equivalent of the NMAT, they, are, they usually go by structure. So you need to have a good understanding or a good grasp of the structures of amino acids. So we have non-polar side chains. We have polar side chains, electrically charged, electrically charged side chains. So let's individually discuss the amino acids. But before going to that, let's first discuss the naming of amino acids. How do we name amino acids and what are the different abbreviations that we have or shortcuts in naming amino acids? So we have a three-letter code and one-letter code. 
So the three-letter code, these are the abbreviations generally consisting of the first three letters of the amino acid name. For a one-letter code, this is actually devised by Margaret Oakley Dayhoff, and this is considered to be the founder, and she is considered to be the founder of bioinformatics. So um, for the one-letter code, the reason why they developed, or she developed that one, is to attempt to reduce the size of data files. Okay, so to describe an amino acid sequence. So if you want, for example, if you want to sequence or you want to know the specific amino acids of hemoglobin, you need to sequence the entire protein. And in order for you to, to sequence the entire protein, you need to know each amino acids that contain the hemoglobin. So that is why it's practical for us to describe amino acid sequence in one letter code. So for the one letter code, so this is um, our guide. So for, so for the six amino acids, so this is the CHIM SV, the first letter of the amino acid, amino acid name is unique and thus, and thus is used as the symbol. Okay, so CHIM SV. So later on, uh, you'll get this. Ano ibig sabihin ng chim SV? So for the other five letter, the first letter is no unique but is assigned to the amino acid that is most common in protein. So ito yung mga AGLPT. They are assigned to the amino acid that is most common in proteins. So another four is used in phonetically suggestive um, words. For example, in arginine, it is... Um, name as R in phenylalanine, the 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 one letter code is F. For tyrosine, the one letter code is Y. For tryptophan, it is read as tryptophan. So that is why its one letter code is W. So later on, ma gets me yet. So the rest were hard to design. So so the four D N E Q amino acids were assigned letters found within or suggestive by their names. So for example, aspartic acid, so they name it, uh, so the one letter code for aspartic acid is D. So it sounds like aspartic acid. For asparagin, letter N. For glutamic, glutamic, so letter E. And glutamine, cutamine. Okay, that left lysine, so only a few letters were left in the alphabet and K was chosen because it was closest to L. So yung one letter code for lysine is K. And the reason why bakit K, kasi mas, siya yung mas malapit sa letter L. Okay, so later makita niya siya. Sige? So these are the amino acids. So we have alanine. The three letter abbrevi abbreviation is ALA. One letter abbreviation is A. For arginine, the three letter is arg, one letter is r. Okay, ito yung sinasabi na r, arginine. So it sounds like arginine kasi may a ka na sa alanine. For asparagine, the three, the three letter abbrevi abbreviation is asn. And the one letter abbreviation is n. Bakit siya n? Because of the asparagine. Mm, nasa last ang, ang kanyang clue, asparagine. For aspartic acid, the three letter abbreviation is asp. The one letter abbreviation is D. So, bakit D? Because as of, the, uh, it sounds like aspartic acid. So, the aspartic acid. For cysteine, the three letter is CYS, easy lang, and C. For glutamic acid is glue. Then, the one letter abbreviation is E. So, glue. Diba? Glue. Elmer's glue. Glutamic acid. Meron isa tayong glue, pero glutamine siya. So, this glutamine, ang kanyang three-letter abbreviation is GLN, and its one-letter abbreviation is Q. So, it is read as cutamine. Okay, cutamine. Again, so glutamic acid. So, glue, as in Elmer's glutamic acid, and cutamine. So that is uh, the, the one-letter abbreviation for Q. For glycine, it's easy. It's gly and G. For histidine, it's H. and for it, It's his and H. For isoleucine, it's I-L-E, not iso, okay? It's I-L-E, isoleucine, I-L-E. The one-letter abbreviation is I. 
for leucine is leu and L for lysine is LYS. But now it's K. Bakit K? Because L lysine is less common than leucine. And wala na dong uh, letters sa alphabet na tira. And L is the next letter closest to lysine. L is K. So that is why K ang kanya one letter abbreviation. So we have methionine, met, and M, phenylalanine, fe, sounds like F, so it is written as F. For proline, it's pro. Uh, one letter abbreviation is P. For serine, it's sir. S. Threonine is THR, it's T. Threonine, even if it's not uh, yung may tatlong T tayo. We have tryptophan, TRP, for, and the one letter is W. So the clue here is tryptophan. So you read this as tryptophan. For tyrosine, your clue here is the Y. So ty is Y. Tyrosine, one letter abbreviation, is Y. Again, for threonine, it's T. For tryptophan, it's tryptophan, it's W. And tyrosine is Y for ty. So Y. So the last is valine. Three letter is val. Then one letter is V. Okay? So let, let us first discuss the non-polar or hydrophobic amino acid. So we have the following. Um, we have the following um, amino acids. So we have glycine, alanine, valine, isoleucine, leucine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and proline. So in non-polar or hydrophobic amino acid, we have two types, right? We have an aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbon group. When you say aliphatic carbon group, the, the side chain is an aliphatic. When you say aliphatic, so I answered the question, it refers to a compound or a carbon-rich compound which has an absence of benzene ring. So I think you know what's a benzene ring that looks like. Yung parang piatos, di ba yung nakita yung piatos? Okay, so ito, ito yung benzene ring. So this is a benzene ring. So an aliphatic compound, it is something that walang ganito, walang ring. So ganito lang siya. Carbon chains lang siya. Hydrocarbon group. Kaya siya tinatawag na hydrocarbon kasi carbon siya with hydrogen. So hydrocarbon. Okay, so the aliphatic hydrocarbon group consists of glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, proline, and methionine. So remember this one. You need to memorize this one. For aromatic hydrocarbon group, it contains a cyclic group that is similar to a benzene ring. Okay? It is a cyclic group that is similar to the benzene ring. So meron siyang ganito. So, it, so ano ito siya? So these are the phenylalanine and tryptophan. So let us first describe the first amino acid which has the smallest side chain, which is glycine. And this is the most basic amino acid. This is the, the smallest amino acid because it contains the smallest side chain. So the R group or the side chain for amino acid is hydrogen. The first element in the periodic table. And this is the, the, the clinical importance of glycine is that it is used in the first step of heme synthesis through this process. And aside from that, glycine is used in the synthesis of purines and creatine. And glycine is also conjugated to bile acids, drugs, and other metabolites. And aside from that, glycine, gly or G, this is considered to be one of the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the spinal cord. So this is the structure of glycine. So please remember the structure of glycine. So this is, again, the carboxyl group. This is the alpha carbon. This is the amino group. And the R group is the hydrogen. Okay, so you have a carbon, hydrogen, a carboxyl group, and amino group. So next is the alanine. So alanine, the R group of alanine or the side chain of alanine is the methyl group. So this is methyl, CH3. So carbon that is bound to three atoms of hydrogen. So that is a methyl group. And alanine is a carrier of ammonia and of the carbons of pyruvate. 
from skeletal muscle to the liver. So they are carriers of the carbon of pyruvates. And together with glycine, they constitute a major fraction of free amino acids in the blood. Now we have the three branch chain amino acids, the valine, leucine, and isoleucine. So the structure of valine. So this valine, the, the R group of valine is the isopropyl group. For leucine, the R group is the isobutyl group. And for the isoleucine iso group, this is a hydrocarbon side chain with a branch. So how many carbon atoms as a side chain of valine? So we have one, two, three. For leucine, you have one, two, three, four. For isoleucine, it's also one, two, three, four. But what makes it different is yung branching. So between I leucine and isoleucine, in isoleucine, um, the carbon is bound, the, the, alpha, the alpha carbon is bound to, um, it's bound to a, a hydrocarbon group, which has a, a three, which, which has, which is branched. Nadaan. Unlike this one, it will have another hydrocarbon before it branches into two. So, yan ang difference ng leucine and isoleucine. So, please remember the structure of leucine and isoleucine and their difference. Okay? And what are the importance or what is the importance of these three amino acids or the, it is called the branched chain amino acid because branched siya kasi nakita niyo, di ba? Branched siya. Nagsasanga siya. So, these amino acids, they are the ones that, is, that are accumulated in the maple syrup urine disease or MSUD. So in this disease, in maple syrup urine disease, it is a rare genetic metabolic disorder wherein the body cannot break down the branch chain amino acids. So BCAAs. So I know some of you kung nakatry na na gym and they try to take in supplements na BCAA, so branch chain amino acids. So ito yung mga branch chain amino acids, the valine, leucine, and isoleucine. So the next amino acid is proline. So proline, the side chain of amino of the proline is actually the amino acid. So the amino acid, this is the amino acid. This is uh, the the no no, it's not a side chain, but the entire thing. This is an amino acid. So proline is considered a secondary amino acid. Secondary amine, okay, because the, the amino group, yung ito, di ba ito yung carboxyl carbon? So this is the alpha carbon. Therefore, this is the amino group. This is a secondary amine. Why is it a secondary amine? Because the amino group is bound to another carbon atom. Hindi lang isa. Kasi di ba normally, ganito lang siya. Isang carbon lang siya nakabound. Here, in proline, you have two carbons that are bound to the amine to the nitrogen of the amino group. So this is, uh, the it is a cyclic structure, but it is an aliphatic um, cyclic structure, not like uh, the benzene ring. So the amino nitrogen is bounded to two carbon atoms. So what is the importance of this proline? So proline contributes to the fiber structure of collagen, and also they interrupt alpha helices in globular proteins. So later, after, when we discuss about proteins, you'll have a good understanding of your know, alpha helices. So please remember, proline, they interrupt alpha helices in globular proteins. So next is methionine. So uh, methionine, they are, they, they, uh, it is one of the sulfur-containing amino acids. So dalawang amino acids natin, which are... Uh, that are considered to be sulfur-containing. One is methionine. The other one is cysteine. So the side chain of methionine is the S-methylthioester side chain. So this is the S-methylthioester side chain of, of the methionine. And methionine, it is important because they are, source, they are the one of the sources of methyl groups in metabol metabolism. So sila nagpro-provide ng methyl group to 
um, to biologic system. So it is involved in the transfer of methyl groups. And methionine is also a precursor of homocysteine and cysteine, which is also an amino acid. Now next is phenylalanine. So phenylalanine can be, so we are now in the aromatic uh, non-polar amino acids. So we have, we have phenylalanine. So in phenylalanine, so it can be viewed as a benzyl group substituted for the methyl group of alanine or a phenyl group in place of a terminal hydrogen of alanine. So it can be viewed as that way. So ito yung benzyl group. Okay. So ang alanine natin is ano lang siya. Di ba ang alanine is carbon? carbon and tatlong hydrogen. So in, in phenylalanine, imagine that you remove one hydrogen of it and attach a benzyl group. Okay? So, uh, no, this is a phenyl group. Okay? So um, ang, ang benzyl group is yung kasali na si CH2. Okay, so a phenyl group is yung ito lang. Okay, so what is the importance of phenylalanine? So phenylalanine is involved in phenylketonuria. So it is the one that's accumulated in the case of phenylketonuria. And phenylalanine is also the precursor of tyrosine. So next is tryptophan. So the side chain of tryptophan is the indole ring. So this is the indole ring. So you have two rings. So it is a bicyclic structure. Ano ibig sabihin ng bicycle? Bicycle, dalawang cycles, dalawang uh, cyclic structure. So you have this one and this one. So it consists of a six-membered six benzene ring. So you have a benzene ring fused to a pyrrole ring. So this pyrrole ring is a five-carbon. So... We say five-membered, five-carbon yun siya. So, so tryptophan, meron siyang um, five-membered uh, uh, five or five atoms. So, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five na pyrrole. And this is the, tryptoph uh, this is the um, benzene ring. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's made up of six atoms. Ang pyrrole is five atoms. And tryptophan, um, it is considered to be the amino acid that has the largest side chains. Ito yung pinakamalaking amino acids. And tryptophan is also the precursor to the neurotransmitter serotonin, the hormone melatonin, and the vitamin B3 or niacin. So polar or let's move on to polar or, or hydrophilic amino acids. So we have neutral polar amino acids and charged amino acids. So for neutral polar amino acids, the polar side chains, um, these are the polar side chains that are electrically neutral at, neut at neutral pH or at, at the normal pH. So what are the neutral amino acids? We have serine, threonine, tyrosine, cysteine, glutamine, and asparagine. Now, glycine is also sometimes included here for convenience because it does not contain any non-polar side chain. So for charged amino acids, it can be basic. So the side chain is charged at neutral pH. Unlike in neutral polar amino acid, the, the side chains are neutral. They don't have any charge at neutral pH or at, at, physio at physiologic pH. So we have two. We have basic and acidic. For acidic amino acids, we have glutamic acid and aspartic acid. For basic, we have three, histidine, lysine, and arginine. So again, histidine is H, li uh, lysine is K, arginine is R. Yung asparagine yung N. So we have polar side chain, which are, which are electrically neutral. Ito yung mga electrically neutral. And this one are the electrically charged amino acids. So you have the acidic and basic. Okay. So let's discuss first the electrically neutral amino acids. So the first in the series is, are the serine and threonine. 
So in serine and threonine, the polar group is the, a hydroxyl group bonded to an, alopha, an aliphatic hydrocarbon group. So in serine, para lang siyang, para lang siyang methionine, uh, para lang siyang, uh, no, no, not methionine, para lang siyang alanine, kasi yung methyl group, dagdagan mo lang siya ng hydroxyl group. You remove one hydrogen and replace it with a hydroxyl group. For the serine side chain, the, si the side chain is hydroxymethyl group. For the threonine side chain, we have a presence of a hydroxyl group in, um, in carbon-3 of the butanoic acid. So ito butanoic acid, ito lahat. Ito, the whole thing, butanoic acid, and the hydroxyl carbon is located at carbon-3. So carbon-1, 2, 3. So that is why nandito siya. Okay, so diba, we mentioned kanina, it's, we assign carbon number one with the atom bonded or bound to the highest atomic number, which is oxygen. So one, two, three. So what are the importance of serine and threonine? They are sites for o lake glycosylation and as well as for phosphorylation of proteins. So this is where glycosylation happens and phosphorylation of proteins takes place. For tyrosine, so what makes it differ from this one? As you notice, it contains um, a benzene ring. So the hydroxyl group in tyrosine is bonded to a hydrocarbon group, which eventually loses a proton at a higher pH. So the hydroxyl group in the tyrosine is a phenol. So ito yung phenol which is a stronger acid than an aliphatic alcohol. So the side chain of this one, of tyrosine, can lose a proton in the process of titration. So ito, pwede ito siya matanggal. Whereas those of serine and threonine would require a higher pH so that, a, uh, that the pK values are not normally listed for this side chain. So, Compared to this one and this one, mas madaling to matanggal itong hydrogen and to form a negatively charged. Okay. So next is um, a continuation pa rin ito sa tyrosine. So tyrosine is very um, important for several reasons. So it is the precursor of several compounds and neurotransmitters. So phenylalanine will give rise to tyrosine. And this tyrosine will be converted into L-DOPA, and L-DOPA will be converted to dopamine, to norepinephrine, and eventually epinephrine. So it is also, tyrosine is also a precursor for the hormones thyroxine and melanin. So in order for you to remember the derivatives of phenylalanine and, ty and tyrosine, try to remember this one. Pare, true love does not exist. So pare is phenylalanine, tyrosine is true. Love is L-DOPA, does is dopamine, and is norepinephrine, exists is E. Okay, for you to remember the, the derivatives of phenylalanine and tyrosine. So next is cysteine. So the cysteine side chain is a thiol group. So kanina para lang siyang serine, pero instead of OH or instead of hydroxyl, it's a thiol group. Okay, and what is important for this one in cysteine is that they can form disulfide bridges or another, it will, for, it will bind to another cysteine group, okay, to form disulfide bridges in an oxidation reaction. Okay, so what is important about this one is that the thiol group can also lose a proton. So, pwede rin siyang madiprotonated. And... So this is the sulf sulfhydryl group that is active in many parts of enzyme. And cysteine also participates in the synthesis of coenzyme A. So you, you'll be encountering later in, 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 uh, in carbohydrate metabolism coenzyme A. So when you think of coenzyme A, they are sulfur-containing compounds because of cysteine. Because it's rich with cysteine. So next is asparagine. So for asparagine, the side chain is carboxamide. So this is the carboxamide side chain. They have a carbonyl group. 
So we have we have a carbonyl group and an amide group that also form hydrogen bond. So it's a tricky part. We have two carbon double bond to oxygen. Okay, but this one, the that this one the the this is not the alpha. This is not the alpha carbon because again, kung alpha carbon siya dapat bound siya to an amino group, to a carboxyl group and a hydrogen. So for this one. The, the, the carbon double bond is bound to an amide group, but the amide group and the, the, the next carbon is, is another carbon. Wala siyang amino group here. So, yan siya. Hindi ito siya consider as alpha carbon. Okay. So this is the side chain of asparagine. So it is called carboxamide. So what is important about asparagine? So asparagine is this is uh, the usual site for N-linked glycosylation of proteins. So yung O-linked glycosylation of proteins, yan yung mga serine natin and threonine. While asparagine, this is um, more on the N-link kasi meron tayong amide group wherein, wherein glycosylation of proteins takes place. This is also, uh, asparagine is also this, uh, a derivative of, of aspartic acid. So this is a basic amino acid. For glutamine, the side chain is similar to a glutamic acid. So later on, you'll see the glutamic acid, except that the carboxylic group is, rep is replaced by an amide. Because it's a glutamic acid, instead of this one, it is bound to an OH. So, yeah, OH or an Ito, ito is pro deprotonated na ito kasi ito siya. So for, for glutamic acid, um, instead of an OH, it is an amide group. So they have a carbonyl group and amide group that also, they can also form hydrogen bond. So these groups have the capacity also to form hydrogen bonding. So glutamine is deaminated by glut uh, by glutaminase resulting in the formation of ammonia. And this is considered to be a major form or a major carrier of nitrogen to the liver from the peripheral tissues. Next is the aspartic acid. Now, aspartic acid, um, they are negatively charged at neutral pH. Why? Because of the carboxylate group side chain. So our side chain also contains a carboxylate group. So meron tayong another, so basically ang amino acid niya, dalawang carboxyl group. Okay, we have the carboxyl group that is bound to the alpha carbon and the side chain carboxyl group. So careful kayo dito, which is part of the basic structure of the amino acid and which is part of the <clears throat> side chain. So you need to remember the structure. So aspartic acid, participate in ionic interaction, they can serve as proton donors. And basically, aspartic acid is alanine with one of the beta hydrogen replaced by the carboxylic side group. So, bakit siya beta hydrogen? Kasi, ito yung carbon, carboxyl carbon, this is your alpha carbon, this is your beta carbon. So, if you, uh, in alanine, CH3 yan siya, di ba? So if you remove just one hydrogen and replace it, it with a, another carboxyl group like this one, you have aspartic acid. So that is why, ito yung definition niya. So the side chain of carboxyl of, carboxyl of aspartic acid is referred to the beta carboxyl group. So ito yung alpha carboxyl group, ito yung beta carboxyl group. So for, glut, for glutamic acid, ang difference niya lang is Diba, isang methylene, ito yung methylene group pala yan siyang CH2. Sa glutamic acid, another methylene group inside chain. So basically, it has more carbon atoms. But the carboxyl, the side chain carboxyl of glutamic acid is called the gamma carboxyl group because again, this is carboxyl group. This is alpha, beta, gamma. Okay, so you have a gamma. And, glutam and glutamic acid, or glutamate, if it's ionized, glutamate, ang tawag kong ma-ionized siya, meaning matanggalan siya ng isang hydrogen and contains a negatively charged, it's called glutamate. 
And this glutamate is the precursor for GABA and glutathione. Next, we have the lysine. So lysine is positively charged at neutral pH. So the side chain amino group is attached to an aliphatic hydrocarbon chain. So oh, aliphatic, so one, two, three, four. So we have four carbon atoms and at the terminal side or at the end of the aliphatic chain is an amino group. For an arginine, so arginine is positively charged at neutral pH, similar to lysine. And the side chain of arginine is what we call a guanidino group. So ito yung structure ng guanidino group. So ano itong guanidino group? It contains, this is a three-carbon aliphatic chain ending with, an, an, with, ending with a guanidino group. So ang guanidino group ito, 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 ito yung guan, guan, um, guanidine group. This is the guanidine group. So sa guanidine group, we have one, two, three, three atoms of nitrogen, the center of which is a carbon that is double bonded to a nitrogen. Okay. So arginine is a precursor of creatinine, urea, and nitric oxide. So next is histidine. So histidine is the most common amino acid in protein active or binding sites because of the imidazole side chain, which is partially protonated. So very, ano ito siya, very um, common for those mga active sites, especially sa enzymes. Maraming histidine dyan. And histidine is also a precursor to histamine. And this is used for the diagnosis of folic acid deficiency using the fig glue excretion test. So in the structure of histidine, so you have a carbon, a methylene group, and a ring-like structure called the imidazole side chain. Okay, so this is what we call the imidazole side chain. So carbon, one, two, three. So you have a three carbon, a one, two, three, four, four carbon, and two nitrogen atoms. Okay. So please remember the structures of the amino acids. And we have the 21st protein L-alpha amino acid, which is the selenocysteine. So this selenocysteine is considered to be the 21st protein amino acid. And it is the building block of iodothyronine, the iodinase enzyme. And instead of, it has a similar structure as that of cysteine, but instead of sulfur, it is um, replaced by, by selenium ion or selenium atom. And this is created via direct insertion into a growing polypeptide during translation. Okay, so let's move on to the acid-base chemistry of amino acids. Okay, so let's continue with the topic on amino acids, but this time we'll be dealing on the acid-base chemistry of amino acids. Now, you can see from the name in amino acids that there's an acid, right? But in reality, this is actually a misnomer because amino acids can act as both acids and bases. Now, in a free amino acid, when you say free amino acid, an amino acid that is not bound to anything, that is not bound to any, um, or is not bound to any other um, amino acid or any substance or ion, for that matter. Now, in a free amino acid, the carboxyl group and the amino group of the general structure are charged at neutral pH. So, at neutral pH, the carboxyl group and the amino group are charged. Now, the carboxylic group is negatively charged while the amino group is positively charged. Now, amino acids without charge group on their side chains exist in neutral solution as zwitter ions with that charge. Now, this is a zwitter ion. And when you say zwitter ion, it is an I this is this is um, a compound or a substance which has equal positive and negative charges in solution that is electrically neutral. So this is an electrically neutral substance. 
Now, substances having this dual acid-base nature are what we call amphoteric and are often called ampholytes from amphoteric electrolytes. So if a substance has both acid-base properties, it is called amphoteric substances or ampholytes. Now, it's very important to know about the pKa values of the charged um, or the charged units of, of the amino acids. Now, you have already discussed about pKa's, right? Now, the pKa of the alpha carboxyl group or the carboxylate group is around two, so it needs to have a base. Uh, it, need to ha it needs to have an acidic environment for for the dissociation of a hydrogen ion from the hydroxyl group of the carboxylate or for the carboxyl uh, the carboxylic acid. So you only need to have a lower pH, but the amino group of the amino acid, it has a pK of 9 to 10, which means that you need to have a basic environment in order for that hydrogen ion, for, for this one hydrogen ion to be dissociated or to be removed from binding from the hydrogen. Okay, so please remember the relative value. So in the carboxylate group or the, in the carboxylic acid group, the pK is around 2 or in the, or, or in the acidic side, while the pKa of the amino group is on the basic side. So please, again, this is the dissociation constants of the amino acids. Okay, so, so let's take, for example, this amino acid. For a general structure, you see this. This is the amino group, and this is the carboxylic acid group or the carboxylate group. Okay? So, so at a very low pH or in a very acidic pH environment of the amino acids, okay, okay, a protonated carboxyl and a positively charged ion is protonated, okay? Okay, so this is the most acidic side. If the environment of this amino acid is acidic, the carboxyl group or the carboxyl group is protonated. When we say protonated, it contains a hydrogen group. And this amino group is also positively charged because you have an additional hydrogen ion or a proton. So again, to, to not be confused, when you say proton, that is also quite similar to hydrogen or synonymous to hydrogen. So at a very low pH, the carboxyl group is actually a carboxylic acid, a protonated form of carboxylic acid. And the amino group is positively charged because you have an additional proton because the, the environment is very acidic. So you have extra hydrogen ions that are available to bind to that um, atom. Okay. Now, as you increase the acidity of the environment or the surrounding environment of the, of the solution of the amino acid, the carboxyl group loses its proton to become negatively charged carboxyl group. So if you increase the pH of the environment and uh, to a point that you will reach the pKa value of the carboxyl group, now this hydrogen or the proton will be dissociated. So if it reaches 2.34, if the pH of the environment is 2.34, then that hydrogen from the carboxyl group will be dissociated to form this carboxylate ion or this carboxylate group, a negatively charged carboxylate group. So you have a negatively charged. And why is that negatively charged? Because you have extra electrons that are available for another base pairing. But for this instance, since you have already reached the dissociation constant, okay. so what happens is that there is no available hydrogen that will bind to the carboxylate group but still in the amino group the extra hydrogen ion is still present and why is that because it needs to have a higher pH a more basic pH in order for the uh, for, for the for the hydrogen ion or the proton to be dissociated okay so again if you add another base if you add uh, if you increase again the amino acid, uh, I mean, uh, uh, if you increase again the the pH of the surrounding amino acid, it will dissociate 
the extra hydrogen that is bound to the amino group. Okay, so this will result in two, um, the, re the release of a hydrogen ion resulting to a neutral amino group, but a negatively charged carboxyl group. So we have an anionic form at a higher pH. Now, in this part, wherein you have both negatively charged and positively charged groups, this is what we call the isoelectric zwitter ion. Okay. So the, uh, so the protonated amino group, so this, is, uh, this is the stage when the protonated group uses a proton, the alanine molecule has a now a charge of one. So for example, in this, uh, if, we, if we have a titration of alanine, so when you titrate it, um, you will form a diprotic substance. Okay, so uh, what's this? Okay, so for example, um, to illustrate the titration curve of the amino acids, so at lower pH, you see that this is the general formula or the general equation of a certain amino acids. So you can see that this is the carboxyl group and this is the amino group. At lower pH, these groups the amino and the carboxyl group are extra protonated. So they, because the, since the environment has a lot of hydrogen ions that are available to bind to this group, so you, so the both groups are protonated, okay? And the amino group is positively charged while the carboxylate group or the carboxylic acid group is neutral. So at lower pH, you have a positively charged or cationic substance. Now, if you increase the pH of the, of the environment, what happens is that from this, uh, uh, if, you increase, if you increase the, if the, if you increase the pH from, from this one, it will result into the formation of, uh, it will result into the release of the hydrogen ion because you have already reached the pKa of the carboxyl group. So, that in that way, um, in that way, uh, the charge of the amino acid is actually equal. If you if you further increase the amino acid until you re, uh, if you increase the pH of the of the surrounding I mean if, of the surrounding solution of the amino acid. So if you make this if you make the environment more basic, then you you'll reach to a point of a higher pH that will result to the the deprotonation or the de, uh, or the dissociation of the hydrogen ion, resulting to an uh, resulting to a negatively charged amino acids. Okay, so this is the now the average between the pK and the pKa of the first dissociation constant and the the dissociation constant of the amino group, the, so the diso dissociation constant of the carboxyl group and the dissociation constant of the amino group, the average of that is the PI, or what we call the isoelectric pH, the pH wherein the the, most of the solution in the, uh, most of the amino acids in the solution are in, are zwitter ions. So meaning they have a positively charged and negatively charged ends. Okay, so this is just another picture of, of, of what they call uh, the titrate of, of titration of amino acids. So this is a picture showing you. Um, wait for a while. So in this, in this, so this is a picture of histidine. Okay, so histidine. It has uh, the, the the side chain of histidine is positively charged. Okay, remember from our previous slides. So histidine is considered is considered uh, it has an imidazole side chain, and it, class, it is classified as a positively charged amino acid as at physiologic pH. 
but at low levels of pH, so at a very acidic pH, it has a net, net charge of positive 2. And why is that? It's because of the side chain okay, that is readily protonated. Okay? So if the side chain is protonated, uh, since protonated, so it is available for another hydrogen ion, which makes this part positive. And the amino group is also positive. So you have a positively charged 2. So plus 2 net charge at very low pH. If you increase the pH of the surrounding environment of histidine, what happens is that the carboxyl group will, loses, will lose a proton, forming a carboxylate, negatively charged carboxylate. But since you still have a hydrogen ion that is bound to the side chain of or the imidazole group of the histidine, okay, this makes the first dissociation, this makes the first dissociation form a plus one net charge because of the presence of a hydrogen um, atom bound to the nitrogen of the imidazole side chain of histidine. So this is still plus one net charge. So this is not a Zwitter ion because, again, uh, this is a Zwitter ion because you have an extra, there's no balancing of the charges yet. Okay, so this will cancel out positive and negative, but still you have a, a positive ion here, which makes it a plus one net charge. Okay, because the positive and negative will cancel out, but still you have a, a, a positively charged side group. And so this is still a positive one net charge. Now, if you increase further the pH surrounding the amino acid, okay, it will reach a pKa that will cause the dissociation of hydrogen of the side chain. Now it's now it, now it is now at the side chain. Now it is found out that the the it is found out that the pKa of the side chain of histidine has a pKa of six, so around somewhat near neutral pH. So this loses an this loses a proton at this pH. So if you use a proton, that is a net minus one charge. So you are now left with the negatively charged carboxyl group and a positively charged amino group. So this is a zero net charge. So this is the isoelectric Zwitter ion. If you increase further the pH of the surrounding environment of the amino acid, you will reach to a point wherein you will reach the dissociation of a hydrogen atom of the amino group. So you will leave now with a negatively charged carboxyl group. Okay. So again, at very low pH value, it, isn't, it has a net positive charge of two. Again, why is that? Because of the amino group, which is positive, and the side chain is also positive. And since this carboxyl group is not yet deprotonated or not dissociated, so this has no charge. Okay. As you increase the pH of the surrounding, so basically if you increase, uh, if you add base towards the surrounding, the carboxyl group loses a proton. So if you compare here, it loses the hydrogen or proton, it becomes a carboxylate. And, um, but still you have a plus one net charge because this one will cancel out. This thing will still have a positively charged end. And if you further add bases, Will increase the pH, the imidazole will lose a proton because of dissociation. You reach the dissociation constant of that part. So you have a zero net charge, and this is the Zwitter ion. Now, as you increase the pH again, you increase more base, you reach to a point where in the amino group will lose a proton, okay, and you now result to a negative one charge. Okay, so again, this is just another graphical representation of. What happens if we titrate amino acids? Okay. So you see the effect of the chemical environment on pKa and certain amino acids. So if um, if you increase the pH, what happens is that there will be dissociation of selected uh, hydrogen ions of the either the Carboxyl, the carboxyl group 
the amino group or the side chain, especially those amino acids which are ionized at the pH. Okay, so tight. So um, the this is a very toxic slide, so we don't expect you to really memorize this one. So it, it just tells you the different PKI values of amino acids because it's not that uh, uniform. So for every amino acid, the alpha carboxyl group has a different PKA value, but somewhat it's around two, right? At the lower pH, while the amino group has, uh, the pH is usually at the nine to 10, that's why it's in range. Okay, and those amino acid which has ionic side chain have also PKA values. Okay, so please watch this video on the concept of isoelectric point and jitter ion for further um, for further information and for clarification and and because this video shows a good explanation of how Twitter ions are formed and the importance of isoelectric points. Now, the application of amino acid pH and Twitter ions and the isoelectric pH is applied in electrophoresis. Okay, so um, later on when you have your further studies in your education, you'll encounter about electrophoresis. Now, basically in electrophoresis, what happens is that um, you want to separate substances Okay, and one principle that we can use in electrophoresis is the um, to achieve the isoelectric point of certain amino acids. So at low pH, most proteins have a positively charged, while at high pH, most have negatively charged. You know the reason for this statement. So at low pH, most proteins have a positively charged because again of the ionized. Uh, because of the of the protonated amino groups and your carboxyl group is also protonated which is a neutral charge and your protonated amino group is a positively charged so at low pH most proteins have positively charged while at high pH most proteins have negatively charged now if there is an in, in electrophoresis you apply an electric field to that gel so this blue thing right here is the gel so in an so in electrophoresis you apply an electric field now the cathode and anode end so the cathode is the negative end well anode is the positive end so it will pull the proteins to their isoelectric point okay where each individual proteins possesses a neutral charge so if there's an electric field it will cause um, it will cause pulling, pulling of amino acid to their isoelectric point so that each individual protein, okay, since proteins are made up of amino acids, will have a neutral charge. Now, proteins, when proteins will stop migrate uh, because they reach the isoelectric point at the pH level, it is where they, uh, no, it will, it is where they, um, the, the proteins will stop, okay? So when proteins reaches their isoelectric point, meaning the amino acids of the proteins are already in neutral form, okay? It will no longer migrate in gel. So how do we compute for the isoelectric? Again, it's the average of the pKa values of the carboxyl group and amino group, but exceptions to those who have charged side chains, okay? So PKA1 is the functional group that is associated at this electric point. So for another, uh, for, for the second PKA group is for the, for the other group that will dissociate at a higher pH. For example, in, in cases of amino acid, the PKA1, the first PKA is the carboxylate PKA while the second PKA is the PKA of the amino group. Okay, so this is the importance of amino acids and pH in the principle of electrophoresis. Okay, so for those amino acids which has 
a charged side chain. So let's take a look with their titration curve. Okay. So focus yourself first in the glutamate. So remember the structure of glutamate. It has a side chain which has also a carboxyl group. Okay, so it has a carboxylic group or a carboxylic acid side chain. Okay, so at a very low pH, the net charge of glutamate is 1. And why is that? It's because the alpha carboxyl group is protonated, so it's neutral. And so since this is alpha, beta, so this is alpha, beta, uh, so the, wait, So the so the beta so the, so the gamma carboxyl group is also protonated at this point of uh, at low pH, and you have an amino group which has also a positively n because again it's protonated at this low pH. Okay. Now if you increase the pH of the surrounding environment, it will cause the dissociation of the carboxyl or the alpha carboxyl group. Okay, so at this point, you already reach Zwitter ion. The Zwitter ion are the isoelectric pH because this at this point the carboxyl group of the alpha carbo uh, uh, that is bound to the alpha carbon is deprotonated or is already dissociated. So you have a negatively n and you have positively n, and this one is it is still um, uh, the carboxyl group of this one is still um, protonated, okay? Now, as you increase further the P surrounding pH of the environment, then the carboxyl group of the side chain, now it's, not, now it's in the side chain, will cause, uh, it will now be dissociated, okay? The proton from that side chain, from the carboxyl from that side chain will be dissociated to form a negatively charged carboxylate side chain. Since you have already two negatively charged carboxylate groups in this amino acid and you have a positively charged amino group, it will, this one will cancel out. You have a negative one charged amino acid. So negative one net charged amino acid. Now as you further, again, you further increase the amino acid pH surrounding surrounding the amino acid, it will now result again to the dissociation of the amino group causing a, neg a minus two. Okay, so this one be this becomes neutral. Now the isoelectric pH is between the pKa of the, car the alpha carboxyl group and the pKa of the uh, the pKa that, uh, that will cause deprotonation or dissociation of the side chain carboxyl group or the gamma carboxyl group. Okay, so that is the isoelectric pH. Now in histidine, so histidine in contrast to glutamate has a positively charged side chain. So I think this was also discussed in the previous slide. So in this slide, so in this titration curve, the hist at lower pH, histidine has still uh, the, the alpha carboxyl group, the amino group, as well as the side chain are protonated. So they have rich in hydrogen ions. So this cause, causes a plus two net charge at a very low pH. Now, as you increase the pH, causing the first, dissoci causing the first dissociation of the carbo alpha carboxyl group, okay, you will now have a plus one net charged amino acid. And why is that plus one? Because you have a negatively charged and a positively charged, so this will cancel out. But still, since you have a positively charged side chain, then you have a plus one net charged amino acid at this point, at this isoelect uh, at this pH level beyond the first. Uh, dissociation constant. Now, as you further increase the pH of the surrounding environment, it will come to a point that will cause the dissociation of the proton of the side chain. So at around 6, at the pH of 6, this hydrogen will be 
dissociated or become deprotonated, causing a neutral side chain, a negatively charged carboxylate, a positively charged amino group, and this one will cancel out. So you have an amino acid that is as with a rayon. So the isoelectric point is higher compared to glutamate. Now, if you further again add another base, you'll cause the dissociation of amino group. Since the amino group is already neutral, side chain is neutral, and you have a negatively charged carboxyl group, so you have a negative one net charge. Okay, so our isoelectric point is between the pKa, where in uh, the pKa where in the there is the dissociation of the side chain, okay, dissociation of the side chain, side chain and the dissociation of the amino group. So that is the isoelectric point of histidine. Now let's move on to the last topic of amino acid, which is the peptide bond and how do peptide bonds are formed. So when you say peptides, these are molecules formed by linking two or more amino acids by an amide bond, which is a type of covalent bond. When we say covalent bond, these are, these are, this is a type of, of bonding wherein two atoms will share an electron. So in peptide bond formation, there's, there will be a formation of sharing of electrons between two atoms, specifically the carbon and nitrogen atoms. So in the formation of peptide bond, a bond is formed between alpha carbon of the amino group and alpha amino of the next one. And in the process of peptide bond formation, water is lost. And this is what we call the process called dehydration reaction. Okay, And the linked amino acids residues remain after water is eliminated. So the, the specific molecular mechanism of action of peptide bond formation is best illustrated in this video. So kindly check this video to see, to check on how do specifically peptide bonds are formed. Okay, so this is a general mechanism on how peptide bond is formed in proteins. So you have two amino acids to form a dipeptide. So for this example, we have a first amino acid and in this amino acid, the, the side chain is hydrogen. So this is glycine. And the second amino acid is also a glycine. So peptide bond formation occurs when the carboxyl group reacts with the amino group. Now, in the process, the hydroxyl group of the carboxyl end reacts with the hydrogen of the amino group forming water. And at the same time, electrons from the carbon, okay, electrons from the nitrogen will be shared by the carbonyl carbon of the carboxyl group forming a peptide bond. So this is a peptide bond formation. And in this peptide bond, you have two amino acids, glycine and glycine. The first, the left end is what we call the amino terminus or N terminus, and the right side portion is the carboxyl terminus, which is the C end. Okay, so the mechanism of peptide bond formation is an example of a nucleophilic substitution reaction, which is a subset of nucleophile electrophile reaction. Now, please note that carbonyl carbon of the carboxyl group is an electrophile, and the nitrogen of the an amino group is a neutrophile. Okay. When you say electrophile, it loves electron. When you say neutrophile, it loves a proton or a hydrogen. Now, take into consideration that the nitrogen of the amino group, okay, of this, for example, this one, this amino group, this nitrogen has a free lone pair of electrons. So since the carbonyl carbon of, of the carboxyl group is an electrophile, okay, the nitrogen having an extra pair of electron will attack the carbonyl carbon forming, um, forming a nitrogen carbon bond or the amide bond. Okay, And in the process, electrons from the second bond of the carbon double bond oxygen are sent to the carbonyl oxygen. So electrons from this one will be sent into this oxygen, the hydroxyl group, and these electrons reform a second bond and the leaving group which is the hydroxyl group okay it has the capacity to bind to another hydrogen to form water molecule so that is why water is formed okay so how do we read peptides 
So this is the convention for reading peptide. So when amino acid sequence of peptide, polypeptide, or protein is displaced, the amino terminal end is placed on the left. So the N terminal is on the left, and the carboxy terminal is on the right. So the sequence is read from left to right, beginning with the amino terminal end. Okay, so you need to practice yourself on how to read peptides. Make sure you memorize. You have already you have already familiarized yourself about the amino acids, because one question that that may be asked in the exam is on the reading on the specific peptide sequence or the amino acid sequence of a peptide. So in reading the peptide bond, it always starts with the amino end and ends with a carboxyl terminal end. Okay, so thank you very much for, for listening for this lecture. And before we end, please view this video on the drawing the structure of peptides to, be, to familiarize yourself on how to read and draw the structure of peptides based on the amino acid sequence. Okay. So thank you very much for listening and have a great day.